I'm Dr. Michael R. Williamson. Uh, I practice at the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico. The topic of my talk today will be ultrasound of hernias. And I have no relevant financial relationships. First, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the right lower quadrant. Most of our anatomy centers around the inguinal canal, as you see in this diagram. The inguinal canal has a deep ring and a superficial ring. One of the important markers for the location of the deep ring is the inferior epigastric artery. So each time we do an ultrasound of the inguinal region, we have to find the inferior epigastric artery. And I will show you how to do that. Other important landmarks here are the rectus abdominis muscle at the midline, uh, the spermatic cord which lies in the back of the inguinal canal, and the femoral artery and vein. This cine shows you what happens embryologically when the testicle descends. So the right testicle slides into the inguinal canal through the deep ring and slides all the way down the canal and falls into the scrotum. The testicle doesn't like to be in the abdominal cavity because it's warm there. So the testicle wants to get down to the scrotum where it's a little bit cooler. <clears throat> the problem is that that canal leads to a pathway for future hernia formation. This is a view from the side. It's the same inguinal canal, fall, and the testicle is falling through the inguinal canal to land in the scrotum. Usually the left inguinal canal closes first, and the left testicle descends first, so hernias are much less common on the left side. The right testicle descends second, and it's more likely that the inguinal canal will remain patent, and therefore there will be a pathway for future hernia formation. Now this diagram shows you the four point, four steps that I use to perform a hernia exam. Number one is to look, find the femoral vein and look around the femoral vein as the patient performs a valsalva and look for a femoral hernia. The femoral hernia projects downward and will pr project all the way into the medial thigh in a worst case scenario. You should have the patient valsalva. Uh, you should be looking at a point where the saphenous vein comes into the femoral vein. Have the patient valsalva two or three times, then slide your transducer more proximally, slide it north to find the inferior epigastric artery. That will be the marker for your deep ring and will be the point where an indirect hernia comes into the inguinal canal and slides down the inguinal canal. Slide on medially with your transducer into Hasselbeck's triangle Hasselbeck's triangle is marked by the inferior epigastric artery, the inguinal ligament, and the rectus abdominis muscle. You'll find a direct hernia in Hasselbeck's triangle. Look around there, and finally, for your fourth spot, slide up the edge of the rectus abdominis muscle, following the inferior epigastric artery, and look for a spagellian hernia, which can occur anywhere along that pathway. A spagellian hernia can occur all the way into the upper abdomen along the edge of the rectus abdominis muscle. So let's talk about terminology a minute. The neck of a, of a hernia is the narrow part that's where it penetrates through a fascial plane, it's where the defect is located. You need to tell your surgeon what the neck size is. The sac or body is the main part of the hernia. That's the sac that contains the bowel or fat contents. It's a sac made out of peritoneum. A strangulated hernia is a hernia where there is ischemia, caused by a narrow neck. You really can't tell this well with ultrasound, and I usually don't try. Incarcerated hernia is a hernia that cannot be reduced. The hernia contents, the fat or the bowel, are caught in the sac and cannot go back into their normal anatomic location. So you should tell the surgeon if the hernia is reducible or non-reducible. That's important. The quick version, once again, femoral hernia, medial to the femoral vein, Femoral hernia moves superior to inferior, mostly in females, wants to strangulate. Indirect hernia comes obliquely into the inguinal region from the anterior inferior iliac spine to the symphysis pubis, tends to be congenital, occurs mostly in males, mostly on the right side, sits anterior to the spermatic cord and likes to strangulate. This is called an indirect hernia because it comes to, into the surgeon's field of view indirectly from above. Direct hernia. 
occur, comes from medial and behind the cord and moves posterior to anterior. It moves directly toward your transducer. It's also called an old man's hernia, occurs in older males, doesn't tend to strangulate, has a wide neck, and is pretty benign, but will get bigger as, uh, as time goes by. Spigelian hernia moves posterior to anterior at the linea semilunaris along the edge of the rectus abdominis. It can occur anywhere along that line. There's no strangulation risk for the most part. And umbilical hernia occurs in females, may strangulate, and may not be exactly in the umbilicus. So here are the sagittal layers of the abdominal wall. You have your external oblique muscle on the uh, most outside, the internal oblique muscles next down, transverse abdominus muscles, the third muscle down, then you run into transversalis fascia, and finally peritoneum. One of these layers has to be penetrated, and of course, usually it's the transversalis fascia because that's the deepest layer. Causes and associations of hernias. So the indirect hernias have a congenital component. All of these hernias are associated with collagen abnormalities. There's an abnormal ratio of type 3 immature collagen to type 1 mature collagen. The same thing that causes lousy collagen causes aortic aneurysms. So other associations include cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking destroys the collagen, makes a cigarette smoker look older. The collagen won't keep their face uh, looking young with good elasticity in the face. And that same thing in cigarette smoke causes hernias, causes aortic aneurysms. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, mucopolysaccharidosis, obesity, poor conditioning, ascites, peritoneal dialysis, and COPD are all other associations. Femoral hernias and umbilical hernias are associated with pregnancies, and the more pregnancies, the greater the risk. A femoral hernia passes through the femoral ring at the entrance to the femoral canal. It amounts to about 20% of hernias in females and about 5% in males. It's usually just above the merger of the saphenous vein with the femoral vein, and usually it's just medial to the vein. There's a risk of strangulation, and in, in a worse case, these will extend into the medial thigh and cause a lump in the thigh. They can contain fat and or bowel. They need to be fixed. The purple blob in this, in this drawing uh, is representing a femoral hernia sitting just below the inguinal ligament and uh, may, as I say, project all the way down into the thigh. This is an example of a femoral hernia. The V marks the femoral vein. The arrows mark a very small, fatty femoral hernia. As the patient performs a valsalva, this hernia projects down into the thigh. This is another larger femoral hernia. The posterior arrow is marking the vein, the femoral vein, and the anterior arrow is marking a larger fat-containing femoral hernia that is projecting down alongside that femoral vein, slightly anterior to it. You need to look for these because these are more common than you think. Indirect hernia. As I said, indirect hernias come indirectly into the surgeon's field of view, so they have an oblique course down the inguinal canal. They enter the deep ring, which is marked by the inferior epigastric artery. So we look for the inferior epigastric artery because that, because that tells us where the deep ring is. The hernia extends from the peritoneal cavity into the deep ring, down the inguinal canal. In a female, the inguinal canal is called the canal of nook. These are often congenital because of a patent canal. Usually these are repaired in, when, a, when a patient is an infant or in childhood. They are more common on the right than on the left. They can contain fat or bowel. The neck, the tight spot, is at the deep ring, and they, these lie anterior to the spermatic cord. So this is an example of where an indirect hernia would occur. This is an, a hernia that is just, in this diagram, a hernia that is just starting down the inguinal canal. They can go all the way down into the scrotum. You can wind up with bowel in the scrotum. This is an example of an of a indirect hernia sliding down the inguinal canal. There's a lot of fluid associated with it. When the patient relaxes, the fat of the hernia pops back up and almost out of the canal, but doesn't quite reduce completely. This is a second example. The arrow shows just a tiny hernia just starting down the inguinal canal at the deep ring. The hypogastric vessels are posterior on this image and marked by, their, marked by the word hypogastric.
And this is another example of an indirect hernia, a stationary, a stationary image just showing the fat extending down the inguinal canal. <clears throat> direct hernia, called an old man's hernia. It's because of lousy muscle tone or incomplete coverage of the abdominal wall uh, at the uh, location of Hasselbeck's triangle. There's a conjoined tendon between the internal oblique muscle, the transversus abdominis muscle, and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. Oftentimes, this is congenitally deficient, and then when a patient gets older, becomes less well conditioned, the patient is set up for a direct hernia. These probably occur because of a tear in the transversalis fascia, and ultimately can tear the transversalis muscle, muscle and the other layers. They usually have a wide, broad neck and are completely reducible, especially when the patient is supine. The hernia contents will just fall back into the abdominal cavity. So this is a, an example of the location. The purple blob shows you where a direct hernia occurs. Oftentimes they're over closer to the rectus abdominis muscle, but they're generally in the lower part of that triangle. <coughs> this is a transverse shot showing the spermatic cord and how an indirect hernia comes down the inguinal canal anterior to the cord and a direct hernia starts out posterior to the cord. The direct hernia will then protrude anteriorly. This is a sagittal view or a side view of the layers of the abdominal wall showing what happens with a direct hernia. The peritoneum is intact but the transversalis fascia has been breached and the peritoneum is protruding through it and making an indentation on the muscle layers. And this is a cine of a direct hernia. The cine, this direct hernia contains fat. And the hernia is protruding towards the transducer. It goes posterior to anterior. A direct hernia is called a direct hernia because the hernia protrudes directly into the surgeon's field of view. This is another direct hernia posterior to anterior, towards the transducer. The hernia, this hernia does not reduce completely, so this is at risk for strangulation. And a third direct hernia, protruding towards the transducer. Occasionally these, these can take a course that's obliquely through the muscles and can be very confusing. Spigelian hernia. This is a defect in the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle can be anywhere along the linea semilunaris, but it's usually in the lower abdomen where the inferior epigastric artery penetrates and, and the rectus abdominis muscle is less broad. This projects posterior to anterior, but also may move obliquely. So this is a typical location uh, at where the purple blob is seen, typical location for a Spigelian hernia. Umbilical hernias occur at the umbilical ring they may increase in size with age. The hernia moves posterior to anterior once again. These may occur because the round ligament, the obliterated umbilical vein, doesn't reinforce the umbilical ring satisfactorily. Or maybe they occur at the umbilicus because of late mid-gut return to the abdomen. Most adults have a para-umbilical hernia and are due to a weak linea alba. The hernia, therefore, does not come directly uh, from behind the umbilicus. You need to repair umbilical hernias because of the tendency to strangulate. This is an example of a non-reducing umbilical hernia. It's fat containing. You can see at the arrows the neck on the hernia and how the fat protrudes through the abdominal wall. This is another umbilical hernia with a very narrow neck and a wider sac, also non-reducible. Complications of repair of hernias. So most hernias are repaired by placing mesh. Uh, you may be asked to look for a recurrent hernia after mesh has been, been placed. The hernia usually occurs along the edge of the mesh, scan the periphery of the mesh, having the patient valsalva. But I will tell you that the mesh is often difficult to see. Sometimes you can see it secondary to vague shadowing, but many times you will have to guess where you think the mesh is. Infection may have fluid, but fluid is normal in the post-op period for a month or so. The spermatic cord will also be thick in the post-op period, and that does not necessarily mean infection. Testicular ischemia will, can occur if the mesh is so tight that it obliterates the testicular artery as it goes down the, t the inguinal canal. The patients will be pretty unhappy about this. Uh, they will present with testicular pain. I always 
look at the testicle when a patient comes back in following a hernia repair. I just want to make sure that that testicle looks okay. In a traditional repair where no mesh is placed, this tends not to happen because the patient uh, will twist and move because of the discomfort and will eventually cause uh, just kind of a natural loosening in the repair. So the steps are, take the transducer, hold it transversely to the femoral artery and vein in the thigh, move up the femoral vein, find the saphenous vein entrance, and look for a femoral hernia. Have the patient valsalva. Then move the transducer proximally on the femoral artery and vein, look for the superficial and deep iliac circumflex arteries. These two arteries go laterally. The next vessel up goes medially and is the inferior epigastric artery. Rotate the transducer into the inguinal canal plane, look for an indirect hernia. Move the transducer medially, look for a direct hernia. Move it up, down, medial, lateral, look in several spots for a direct hernia. Then move the transducer superiorly along the edge of the rectus abdominis and along the inferior epigastric artery. Look for a spagellian hernia. Now you need to do it all again standing. Many of these patients are not in good condition. They cannot generate enough pressure doing a valsalva while they are supine. But if you stand them up, their body weight will help them do a really good valsalva and the hernia will pop out. So you also need to do them supine. You can't just do them standing because the, ana the anatomy is easier to find supine and sometimes you will only see the hernia in a supine position. These are the vessels I referred to about two minutes ago. You start on the femoral artery and vein. Follow the femoral artery up to, till you see the superficial iliac circumflex artery. It goes laterally. Go up a little further. The next laterally uh, preceding artery is the deep circumflex iliac. Go up a little more and you'll find the inferior epigastric artery. That's the marker for your deep ring. Once again, it's four steps. One, two, three, four. One is the femoral hernia adjacent to the femoral vein in the proximal thigh. Number two, look for the indirect hernia at the deep ring where the inferior epigastric artery is your marker. Number three, go medially, look for the direct hernia. Direct hernia comes posterior to anterior. And direct hernias are the most common hernia that I see almost always in older males who smoke. Number four, look for a spagellian hernia at the location of the rectus abdominis and inferior epigastric artery. Stand the patients up. You've got to stand them up or you won't be able to find these hernias. <clears throat> if you want to read more about this, there is a very good article by Tom Stavros and Cynthia Rapp from Ultrasound Quarterly in 2010. When I was trying to figure all of this out, I used surgery textbooks to try to understand it. This article gave me a great deal of insight and helped me kind of refine my technique. I ultimately, with Jared Bertelson, have written another article that was in the Ultrasound Clinics of North America in 2014. Hopefully that will add something to your knowledge also. With these two articles, you should be able to figure out how to do this. Thank you very much.